O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. On this Trinity Sunday, we begin by singing together, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. come into your presence with a sense of awe and wonder recognising that although we know you we cannot fully understand you for you are the creator of all things your knowledge and power stretch way beyond our imagining and yet we have come to know that you, the God of the heavens, love us. We are here today because we share in that understanding of your love for your people. Your people being anybody who wants to reach out to you anybody who will accept your love and your grace and your spirit. We join together in fellowship as one community recognising that your love flows to us and through us. And so, Father, as we bring our different experiences of life 
into this fellowship. We know that whatever we have done or said or thought has been known by you already. And however it has gone away from your path and the way you would want us to live, we know that your forgiveness and your grace awaits us already. Father God, as we bring our whole selves, we ask that you will accept us. We ask that through Jesus, we may come to you. And through your spirit, we may remain with you in all that we do. Father, we bring our prayers for this world that it too may understand your love, that it may demonstrate through its people the love that comes from you and needs to reach out to everybody. You sent Jesus to live and to die for us. You sent the one most precious to you to take the risk to bring us into your family. And however we understand you, however we see you, we come with grateful thanks, seeking your love afresh in our hearts. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In the wonderful name of the Lord. Our Lord and Ruler, your name is wonderful everywhere on earth. You let your glory be seen in the heavens above. With praises from children and from tiny infants, you have built a fortress. It makes your enemies silent, and all who turn against you are left speechless. I often think of the heavens your hands have made and of the moon and stars you have put in place. Then I ask, why do you care about us humans? Why are you concerned for us weaklings? You made us a little lower than you, you yourself and you have crowned us with glory and honour. You let us rule everything your hands have made and you put all of it under our power, the sheep and the cattle and every wild animal, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea and all ocean creatures. Our Lord and Ruler, your name is wonderful everywhere on earth. Amen. We sing together our next hymn, Thy Ceaseless unexhausted love and unmerited and free.
what Jesus' followers must do. Jesus' eleven disciples went to a mountain in Galilee, where Jesus had told them to meet him. They saw him and worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came to them and said, I have been given all the authority in heaven and on earth. Go to the people of all nations and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to do everything I have told you. I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Let's sing our next hymn. Sunday at Trinity Church and it's not the first time that that's happened so I was looking for some inspiration a different way of putting forward the message and I so happened to be reading a book by the former Bishop of Woolwich the man who wrote Honest to God John T. Robinson he was a bit controversial in the 60s and he had views that tried to bring in his ideas the church and its message into the modern day. So being in the middle of this book I skipped to the chapter that was on the Trinity thinking ready-made sermon. He begins with a question given to him at the end of one of his services. It was, how would you teach to a child the doctrine 
of the Trinity. He said, in his book at least, that it wouldn't just be to a child. His answer would be, I wouldn't. He goes on helpfully to mention the Aphanesian Creed, which begins, The Father, incomprehensible. The Son, incomprehensible. The Holy Ghost, incomprehensible. I thought, this isn't really helping me. But it did get slightly better. As Mr. Robinson decided to put the idea of God and also of knowing people in terms of relationships. He said that the Trinity was, I suppose, a way of the early church describing aspects of their relationship with God that didn't fit into one word or one neat box. It's the idea of theology in three dimensions. I suppose we should be thankful that the early church did have three dimensions, whereas scientists today have anything in excess of seven. I'm not sure you would want a seven-point sermon. But thinking in terms of relationships brought me, along with the lectionary, to what we often say at the end of our services. The blessing from 2 Corinthians 13. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And so, tweaking the order slightly, what I am going to look at this morning is our relationship to God in those three elements. I was surprised a couple of nights ago when watching Britain's Got Talent to find that the judges referred to one of the contestants in terms of them receiving a gift from God. Another judge used the phrase God-given talent. It's not a show that you would normally associate with references to religion. And yet, I suppose, it is a common theme around the world and through history for people to associate and attribute and attribute and attribute wonderful things, hard to understand things, and miraculous things with a being that they might call God. All of the ancient cultures worshipped gods of different types, turned to them in their hour of need, in times of battle in particular, expecting some support. So there was a feeling that something unknown and powerful was out there. The Israelites obviously were able to develop that as they came to know the God that led them from Egypt. The God who was reliable and powerful. The God that they could build their whole lives around. But it's one thing to acknowledge a God and it's another to feel a relationship with them. And certain characters from the Old Testament clearly did have that 
close contact, communication with God. The likes of Moses and Elijah and Abraham. They understood that there was a God who wanted to know them as well as them wanting to have a God that was there for them. In The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy finds herself in a difficult situation, alone in a difficult and unknown place. And the whole story in Oz is based on her finding the wizard. The wizard of Oz. The wonderful wizard of Oz. Who will presumably have the power and the will to get her back home. To do for her what she needs. And the sad part of the story is that when Dorothy finally unearths the wizard, he is a fraud. He cannot do what she needs him to do. But at least he guides her to use her own strength and her own skills. The Jews found that their God was not like the wizard. Their God could fulfill promises, could protect them, could make them powerful. But alongside that power and wonder comes a sense of awe. A sense that this was not an even relationship. That God was up there and we are down here. And God does nothing wrong and can do anything. But we, time and time again, do the wrong thing and move away from him. If you went for a new job or you were going somewhere to join a new organisation you might meet the boss the boss might impress you the boss might, feel, might seem kind and helpful knows what they're doing and when you are in that place of work or that situation you would have respect but you would always have moments when you wondered what they'd be like if you did something wrong what they'd be like if you let them down and would you tell every secret to that boss would you feel comfortable in doing so? At school, we are forever trying to make the girls aware that we care for their welfare. We want them to be safe, to be happy, as well as be successful academically. And we often seem to be asking them if they are sure there is a trusted adult, someone they can turn to, someone they can talk to, and they all nod, and they all confirm that they're fine, and I always wonder whether when the crunch comes, they can truly trust me, or another teacher, or even their parents, <coughs> with everything because it's not an even relationship so in the Old Testament the Jewish people 
had come to terms with the idea that God was there for them. But God was up there. For the Pharisees, for the religious leaders, wrongly as it turned out, they were probably quite confident that they were almost on an even footing with God. That they could do everything he wanted them to do. That they could fulfil their part of the bargain. But to most people, it was made abundantly clear that every step they took that was wrong led them away from that relationship. And unlike any other religion, in our religion we find that God wanted to bridge that gap by his deed, not expecting us to bridge it ourselves. And that, when we say the blessing at the end of a service, is what we really mean by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the grace is basically putting us right with God. It is something that needed to be done to break down all of the barriers, to pay the price, and whatever, whatever other ways we want to describe it. God sent Jesus to come and live a life like ours, but without failing, and then to die so that we too need not worry about that failure separating us from God's love. Jesus came to wipe away all of the barriers. And we could argue that that being once paid is the end of the matter. For surely now if our boss says to us, look I've done something which means that any mistake you make I can just ignore. It doesn't quite do the whole job. Jesus came to pay a price, but he also came to be that personal relationship. That person that can introduce us. That person that can take us to where we need to be. We find that the grace of Jesus opens the door. But we are still tempted or concerned about moving through. I remember a holiday we had in Sicily. We'd hired a car from the airport and we were staying the first night in Catania. It's a very old Italian town. It's very tightly knit. The roads are narrow. Some of them are one way, some of them are two way. But it didn't seem to help us finding the one that we needed. We had a map. We had a sat nav. But I don't think it was up to the job. And we drove round and round in circles. And it was almost like, well, we know it's in there somewhere, but how do we get into there? In the end, we stopped and asked for help. And even the man that we asked was bemused as to how he could give us instructions. He tried and gave up and got in the car and took us there. Rather out of his way, he got out when we arrived and just walked back to the cafe that he'd been in to start with. 
He had taken the time and the trouble to make sure we were where we needed to be. That is what Jesus can offer us. When we have our doubts, when we're not sure the way we should go, he has been there before. He knows the way. He trusts that when we get there, it will be worth arriving. I suppose it's like if you start that new job and you are given a kindly mentor who will always tell you when the deadlines are, who will always guide you on the ways that you should work, who will introduce you to other people in the business and to clients and whatever else is needed. Or perhaps you recognise somebody already working there and it lifts your spirits because you know you are not alone. At school we have a number of things but one of them is a job title of bullying ambassadors. I can assure you this is not a group of people who are trying to advocate the idea of bullying, but rather the opposite. They are other students. People that you can go to who have had some training, who are confident about asking teachers if more advice or guidance is needed but are approachable because they're like us. There's somebody who may have experienced the same things. There's somebody who has been through it before. And therefore, it should be easier for us to approach them and ask for their help. Jesus has been there before. He will take us where we need to go. His relationship to us is much more personal. We might think that's all that's needed. And probably up to the point of Jesus' death, his disciples thought that was enough anyway. Two for the price of one. Better than any other offer that they'd heard of. But Jesus says, there is a Holy Spirit. There is another part of the Trinity. Years ago, we went to the wedding of a friend of mine. The wedding was a fairly big gathering and so was the reception. Sarah, my friend and her husband I suppose knew everybody that was there in some capacity. But apart from Sarah we knew very few people. And so it delighted us although it also worried me because I'm a stickler for the rules that a friend that I recognised said come and sit with us and shuffled round all the nameplates <laughs> it was interesting during the meal to overhear people on another table saying but I'm sure we were told we were going to be sitting with such and such how did this happen? Being in a gathering of people who all have the same friend in common, who all have the same relationship with that friend, does not necessarily mean that that gathering is unified 
that that gathering is relaxed and welcoming for everybody in it. I often wonder as I read the Gospels about those stories where Peter, James and John were taken aside to the transfiguration of the Garden of Gethsemane to the healing of the little girl. How did the other disciples feel about that? How did they feel about what could be described as favouritism? Yes, I'm Jesus' friend, but am I his best friend? And what situations in life do we experience when we don't see that sort of imbalance? The temptation to think that somebody is more important than somebody else. Before the service this morning, somebody passed the vestry and said, oh, are you the headmaster today? <laughs> and then referred to themselves as the dinner lady. I said, only half-jokingly, much more important. The Holy Spirit completed the church. When the Holy Spirit rested on the disciples, it wasn't just power that it gave. It was unity and fellowship. And I don't think it's an accident that Paul writes the fellowship of the Holy Spirit in his letter to the Corinthians. St. Dorotheus, who I have to admit I have never heard of other than this quote, says that we draw closer to each other as we draw closer to God. Someone else described it as the spokes of the wheel. As you go nearer the centre, the spokes draw nearer to each other as well. The Holy Spirit allows us to be a fellowship rather than a meeting. It allows us to welcome and accept each and every other person and the stranger who walks in the door for the first time in a way that normal human relationships don't. It allows us to remove the doubt, to remove the suspicion, and recognize that the influence that the Spirit has on us makes it impossible to ignore the needs of those around us. How wonderful when I go to that new job if everybody is welcoming, if everybody not just welcomes me, but clearly works well together and welcomes each other day by day, looks out for each other, wants everybody else to do well, celebrates their success as much as their own. And what's really needed in schools is not an adult you can go to in times of doubt and trouble not even an anti-bullying ambassador or mentor from your own community of students it's an atmosphere and a feeling and a community where everybody feels valued everybody feels welcome that's the bit of the relationship that the Holy Spirit enables. And so those are three aspects 
of the very complicated image that we might have of God. There are, as I've suggested, many more. And each of those we could go into in far more detail. But returning to John Robinson, at the end of this chapter, which perhaps didn't help me that much with the sermon, he did come round to an idea that you wouldn't teach a child the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. But you would try to enable them to live that doctrine through understanding and accepting the love of God the grace of Jesus Christ and the fellowship enabled by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we sing our next hymn. Holy Spirit, come confirm us in the truth that Christ makes known. come to you with our prayers for your world, a world that is in need of big answers, power and wisdom, things that we cannot achieve ourselves and must trust in your love for the world. We pray for places torn apart by war, for the Ukraine and Russia, for Afghanistan, ruled by a government that forces their views on everybody. for Palestine in conflict for so many years with Israel. For the train crash that has caused so many deaths. Father, 
for we have no answers to natural disasters, to tragedies, even when sometimes it is man that causes them. All we can do is trust in your power. Trust that you are watching over the world, that you can influence world leaders, that you can comfort those who are suffering. We pray, Father, that people in need may be comforted by the knowledge of your love and your reliability in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Gracious Jesus, the one who has brought us back to the Father, we thank you and we praise you for what you have done for us and in our lives. We thank you that we know you and we can trust in you because you understand us. We pray for those people who need a friend, who need the closeness that you can offer. We pray for those who have difficult decisions to make in regards to the cost of living, to supporting families, to making choices about relationships and jobs. We pray for those who worry about those they love. Lord Jesus, you came to bring us back to God, but also to challenge us, to show us the way we should live. And so we ask that you will guide us and strengthen us in reaching out to others who are in need. We pray for all of those organisations that we can read about at the beginning and end of our services here at Trinity. We pray for the need that they fulfil, bringing you into the lives of others. But we also pray for the things we can do for those we can reach out to, we can demonstrate our love to. Father God, we pray that your church throughout the world may demonstrate the love that you sent in Jesus, that we may each be your ambassadors so that others may be comforted and may also know your power. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. And Holy Spirit, hear us. We ask that you will fill our individual souls, but also fill us as a fellowship that we may be able to work for God and for Jesus. That we may be able to have the power in community 
to show others that your presence is real in this place and through our lives. We pray that we can support each other in times of need. That they may have confidence in seeking our help. And we pray that those who walk through our doors may be filled immediately with an understanding of something special. Through the power you bring and the fellowship you offer, Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we know that each day we need you in different ways and that you are always open to showing yourself in a way that means something and matters in that situation. We thank you for the privilege of being yours and we ask through the power of your spirit we may be yours in all we do as we leave this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now we make our offerings for God's work in this place. Father God, we bring our gifts of money and we bring ourselves, offering ourselves into your service. For we know we are here because of you. We are here because of your love. Because of the victory Jesus has won to restore us to our relationship with you. And we are here surrounded and filled by your spirit. So with your blessing, we ask that these gifts may be used, and we with them, in your service. Amen. closing hymn this morning is lead us heavenly father lead us all the world's tempestuous sea guard us guide us keep us feed us for we have no help but thee
say together that blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.